It's an honor to be able to present to RubyConf Thailand. My presentation today is on Rhoda, Ruby's fourth most popular web framework after Rails, Sinatra, and Grape. Now, Rhoda was released back in 2014, so it's over eight years old now. And Rhoda is focused on four goals, simplicity, reliability, extensibility, and performance. So in this presentation, I'll discuss how Rhoda achieves those goals and why you may want to use it in your applications. My name is Jeremy Evans. I'm a Ruby committer who focuses on fixing bugs in Ruby. I'm also the author of Polished Ruby Programming, which was published last year. This book is aimed at intermediate Ruby programmers and focuses on teaching the principles of Ruby programming, as well as trade-offs to consider when making implementation decisions. So what differentiates Rhoda from other Ruby web frameworks is that it is based on the concept of a routing tree built out of Ruby blocks. So here's what that looks like. The routing tree integrates routing with request handling, which has multiple advantages compared to routing approaches that are used by other Ruby web frameworks. You use Rhoda's route method to set the routing tree for the application, and all requests to the web application are yielded to the routing tree block. Rhoda's convention is to use R as the name for the route block variable. Now, unlike most other Ruby web frameworks, where you do not have control over the details of the routing process, with Rhoda, you fully control how routing happens. And you control routing by calling methods on the request object. So here, r.on will yield to the block if all of the arguments match the request. So if the request path starts with slash foo, this will not match, and routing will continue after the method. However, if the request path starts with slash album slash followed by some number, this will match, and that part of the path will be consumed, and the block passed to the method will be called. Because the integer class was used, if this matches, the number will be yielded to the block as an integer. And this makes it simple to extract data from the request path instead of having to reference into a hash of parameters. Now, this is the line that shows the true power of Rhoda. At any point during routing, since you are writing the routing code, you can implement your own behavior. Now, in this case, we're using the integer taken from the request path, and we're trying to find a matching album. And if we find the album, we set the album instance variable, which all routes inside this branch can use. Now, this ability to share logic and perform arbitrary actions at any point during routing is what makes Rota applications significantly simpler than applications written in other frameworks. So if we find a matching album, routing continues. The next method called is r.is with no arguments, which will only match if the request path has already been completely consumed. So this will match for requests such as slash albums slash one, but not for slash albums, slash one, slash tracks. Now, assuming that the request path was fully consumed, the block passed to r.is will be called. Now, inside this block, we have calls to r.get and r.post. r.get will yield if the request method is get, and r.post will yield if the request method is post. Inside the r.get and r.post blocks are where you would put the code to handle the related routes, which can both use the album instance variable. Now assume the request path is slash albums slash one slash tracks. In that case, the r.is method will not match, and r.is returns without yielding the block, and routing will continue to the next expression, r.get with an argument of tracks. So this will only match if the request method is get, and the remaining part of the path not yet matched is slash tracks. So if the request path is slash albums slash one slash tracks and the request method is get, this will match because the slash albums slash one part was already matched by the r.on call and the r.get call will match the remaining slash tracks. 
So hopefully that gives you a flavor for how routing works in Rota. The most important part to remember is that Rota allows you to run arbitrary code at any point during the routing process. Now I mentioned that Rota focuses on simplicity, reliability, extensibility, and performance. And of these, performance is the most objective advantage in that you can directly compare the performance between Rota and other Ruby web frameworks. Now, Tech Empower has a fairly well-known set of web framework benchmarks. These are the results of the benchmarks when using the Puma web server. As shown here, the combination of Rota with the SQL database library is the fastest. It's about 60% faster than Sinatra in SQL and over five times faster than Rails. Now, one thing to be aware of is that Tech Empower's benchmarks only benchmark applications with a small number of routes. And it's also useful to benchmark an application with a large number of routes. So the R10K benchmark uses applications with 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 routes to check for routing scalability. And to avoid the web server overhead, it tests using the Rack API directly. Now here are the runtime results for Rota, Sinatra, Rails, and Hanami. And pay no attention to the absolute numbers. It's only the relative performance differences that matter. And while the graph makes it obvious that Rota is much faster, it's hard to see how much faster. So in this benchmark, Rota is about 13 to 675 times faster than Sinatra, 40 to 75 times faster than Rails, and five to eight times faster than Hanami, depending on the number of routes. Now in terms of memory usage, Rota always uses the least amount of memory, with about 15 to 65% less memory at 10 routes, and 55 to 60% less memory at 10,000 routes. I think most of us know that performance differences in benchmarks are often not a good indication of performance differences in real-world applications. I've converted multiple production Rails applications to Rota, and my experience is that Rota is about twice as fast for the, as Rails for the same production application while using a third less memory. Now, Rota wins easily on performance, but to me, the larger advantage is that Rota allows you to write simpler code to implement your web application. When you can write simpler code, you're likely to decrease the number of bugs in your application and make it easier to fix those bugs and add features. Now, the simplicity advantage that Rota offers compared to most other Ruby web frameworks is due to its integration of routing and request handling. Rota recognizes that routing a request is not an end in itself. It's purely a means to make sure that the request is handled correctly. So with the routing tree, routing is not separate from request handling. The two are integrated. So as you are routing a request, you can also be handling the request. In most other Ruby web frameworks, routing is separate from request handling. Now the advantages of the integration of routing and request handling may not be obvious. I gave an example earlier, but I'm going to discuss the integration advantages in more detail and then discuss what web frameworks that lack this integration offer in terms of similar functionality. So let me first start with some example Sinatra code. Here we have two routes, both related to a specific album, one for get and one for post. And when I was using Sinatra, this was a common pattern in many of my applications. Now Sinatra's approach leads to duplication. Here you can see the path is duplicated in both of the routes and the conversion of the parameter from an integer, from a string to an integer, and the retrieval of the album from the database is also duplicated in both of the routes. So using a routing tree, you can simplify things. Instead of duplicating the path in both cases, it's specified once in the branch. Additionally, by using the integer class argument, the conversion of the parameter from a string to an integer happens automatically. And another advantage of using integer class as a matcher is that this route will only match if the ID provided is an integer. It will not match in other cases. Now, as soon as the branch is taken, the album is retrieved from the database, and in both the get and post routes, the album instance variable is available for use. So one of the primary advantages of a routing tree is that it allows you to easily eliminate redundant code by moving it to the highest branch where it is shared by all routes underneath that branch. Now, it is possible to do something similar in Sinatra. You can use before blocks in Sinatra and provide a path to the before block. And Sinatra will iterate over all of the before blocks before routing the request 
checking each to see if the request path prefix matches the before block, and if so, it will yield it to the before block. So using a before block, you can still convert the parameter to an integer and retrieve the album from the database in a single place. But you now need to specify the path itself three times instead of just once. And unlike when using a routing tree, the shared behavior is in, in a separate lexical scope, which makes it more difficult to understand the connection between the shared behavior and the route handling methods. The two routes are also in separate lexical scopes, which makes it more difficult to understand how they are connected. Additionally, using before blocks like this in Sinatra has a significant negative effect on performance. Now in Rails, you specify the routes in the config routes RB file, and the code to handle the routes goes in a separate controller class, a separate file, usually using a separate method per route. Now the separation of routing code and controller code is one of the things I dislike about Rails. I think it adds con significant conceptual overhead, since it takes more work to figure out where the code that handles the route will be located. Now, as in the initial Sinatra example, this approach duplicates the parameter conversion and the retrieval of the album from the database in both cases. Now, Rails also offers a way to eliminate the redundant code by using a before filter to specify a method to call before the action for a given set of actions. Now, the main issue with this approach is that if you want to add more routes where you want to retrieve the album, you need to manually update the only option to the before filter. Also, just like when you try to share behavior in Sinatra, the shared behavior is in a separate lexical scope, which makes it more difficult to understand how it is connected to the route handling methods. So Sinatra and Rails, and most other Ruby web frameworks, can use before filters to emulate code that is placed at the top of a routing tree block. However, how can you handle more complex cases? Now let's assume you want to run code only for some of the routes in a branch and not all of the routes in a branch. As Rhoda's routing tree is directly executed for each request, you can run arbitrary code at any point during routing, not just at the top of the blocks. One of the common places where this is useful is when doing access control. So if part of your site allows anonymous access and part of your site does not, you can place the part that allows anonymous access first and then run the check for a login and then have the rest of the routes where anonymous access is not allowed. Note that this is an issue with most sites that support authentication, since the login action must be available to users who are not already authenticated. Now, this type of access control is kind of a pain to handle in Sinatra. So when I was using Sinatra, the usual way I would handle this would be to specifically whitelist each path or prefix that allowed anonymous access. And that works okay if you have only a small number of paths that allow anonymous access. But it quickly becomes difficult if you have a large number of paths that allow anonymous access. Implementing this type of access control is also more complex in Rails. So usually in Rails, this would be handled by using a before filter and application controller that required a login. And then in each controller where you want to allow anonymous access, you need to skip the before filter. So this spreads the access control handling to multiple places in your application. And again, requires you to specifically whitelist each of the allowed actions. Now, for individual routes, these improvements may seem small. However, in my experience, the majority of routes in an application benefit from the ability to share logic using a routing tree. For a large application with many routes, all of the improvements add up and result in a much simpler application. So I analyzed a small application that I had originally developed in Sinatra and later converted to Rota. This application has 72 total routes. To get to those 72 routes, there are a total of 35 branches in the routing tree. And of the 35 branches, 29 contain code that is shared by all routes under the branch. And that means that 83% of the time that I'm branching in the routing tree, Rhoda's integration of routing and request handling is resulting in the elimination of duplicate code. And it also shows that Rhoda's use of a routing tree in this case, eliminates 29 separate before filters that would be needed if you used Sinatra or Rails and wanted to avoid the same redundancy. Now, using a routing tree makes it natural to share code for all routes under a branch. So web applications that use a routing tree tend to avoid redundant code naturally. Using before filters to emulate redundant code is not natural in most other web frameworks. So even though it's possible, 
is often not done, and the natural approach leads to redundant code. And one big problem I've seen related to redundant code is, is that redundant code is not always consistent. It's common to have two similar routes where you want to share some behavior. However, over time, you make a change in only one of the routes and not both of the routes. It's especially bad when this inconsistency is related to access control, because when that happens, it often results in a security vulnerability in your application. Now, avoiding redundancy and inconsistency does not eliminate security issues, but it does help to reduce them. Another aspect of simplicity is how simple it is to handle upgrades to the framework. Some web frameworks radically change their API between versions, making upgrading to a new version difficult. This is an example of revolutionary change. The rotor rejects revolutionary change and chooses evolutionary change instead. So to make upgrading simple for the user, Rotor ships a new minor release every month, usually adding a new plugin, feature, or optimization. When Rotor does break compatibility in major version upgrades, it includes backwards compatibility plugins. So almost all Rota 1 applications that were written in 2014 can be run on the current version of Rota with the addition of a plugin or two. So now that I've discussed Rota's simplicity advantages, I'm going to talk about reliability. And one way to look at reliability is in terms of the framework itself being reliable. And you could call this internal reliability. And part of Rota's reliability comes from the fact that it has 100% line and branch coverage for all code. And while internal reliability is important, it's probably more important to you that your framework allows you to write more reliable applications. And Rota has two features that result in your applications being more reliable. One way that Rota can make your applications more reliable is by allowing them to be frozen at runtime. So by freezing an application after it is configured, but before it starts accepting requests, you can eliminate most issues caused by the application being modified at runtime. So Rota pioneered this approach of freezing web applications at runtime years ago, and as far as I know, is still the only Reboot Web Framework to support and encourage being frozen at runtime. Now, one unexpected advantage of freezing Rota applications is that Rota can perform additional optimizations for frozen applications by inlining methods where it knows that the implementation of the method has not been modified. And this type of optimization is only safe when freezing an application because no further changes can be made to the application after it is frozen. Now, another way Rota, Rota increases reliability is to avoid polluting the scope of your application with instance variables and constants, or sorry, instance variables and methods that the user might want to use. Rota believes that you should be able to use the instance variables and methods that you want in your application. So one of my production applications deals with many different types of requests, such as requests for time off. Another application deals with responses received from other companies. It's natural in my application to store a time off request in an instance variable named request and a company response in an instance variable named response because those will be the instance variables I want to use in the related templates. And this approach works just fine in Rota. Unfortunately, if you're using Sinatra, this approach does not work. So here's the equivalent Sinatra code. It does not work because Sinatra uses the request instance variable internally to store information related to the HTTP request. So if you do this, Sinatra will raise an exception later. Similarly, Sinatra stores the HTTP response in the response instance variable. So if you do this, Sinatra will raise an exception later. Rota avoids the problems that Sinatra has by prefixing all instance variables that are used internally with an underscore, and I believe Rails uses a similar approach. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to method pollution, Rails does not fare nearly so well. As of Rails 7, inside a Rails controller action, there are over 300 additional methods that are not prefixed by an underscore beyond the methods defined by default by Ruby in object. If you override any of these methods, you could potentially cause problems with the framework and break things. Inside Rota's routing tree, there are only six additional methods defined by default. And this reduces the chance that you'll want to define a method that the framework uses. So those are the three approaches that Rota uses to achieve high reliability. First, maintain 100% line and branch coverage. Second, run frozen in production to avoid possible issues. And third, avoid polluting the execution environment with instance variables and methods that the user may want to use.
So now that I've discussed how Rota achieves its goals of performance, simplicity, and reliability, we can discuss the final goal, which is extensibility. So Rota's goal of extensibility means that Rota has a very small core, which is focused on routing requests via the request method and path. All of the non-core features are added via plugins. So Rota ships with over 100 plugins, and there are many plugins that are shipped in external gems. Plugins can add methods to the scope of the route block, as well as methods to the request and response classes. Now, each Rota plugin is similar to a tool, and Rota ships with a large toolkit. Some web applications may require HTML template rendering, and other applications may require the ability to return data in JSON format. When you're using Rota, you choose the appropriate tools from Rota's toolkit, and you build your application using those plugins. You do not have to pay the cost for any of the tools that you are not using. One of Rota's core tenets is that you only pay for what you use. So I'm not going to highlight some of the plugins that ship with Rota and discuss the features that they add. Rota ships with support for a complete view layer using the Render plugin. The Render plugin supports pretty much any template engine you would like to use, and like Rails, Rota's default template engine is ERB. Now, the Rota render plugin has extensive support for compiled templates to ensure that your template rendering is as fast as possible. It even uses the compiled template support in development mode to increase development velocity. If you want to handle automatic generation of JavaScript and or CSS during development and compile them into single files for use in production, Rota ships with an assets plugin for that. Rota's assets plugin is simple to configure and does not require any alternative language runtime such as Node installed unless such a runtime is required by the asset template engine that you choose. If you want to serve static files from a directory, Rota has a public plugin that supports that. And because Rota exposes the static file serving as part of the routing tree, it's possible to have static files served only if the request has passed access control checks. Now, in some cases, you may have multiple directories used to serve static files, such as the ability to support different file types or to serve different classes of users. Rota has a multi-plugin that you can use to do that, which will serve separate static file directories at different points in the routing tree. As an example of how minimal Rota is, Rota does not have a method for HTML escaping by default. Rota ships with an H plugin that adds in an H method for HTML escaping. Now, for, HT, for API applications that are designed to return JSON instead of HTML, Rota ships with a JSON plugin. The JSON plugin allows your routing tree blocks to return arrays or hashes, which will be automatically converted to JSON and used as the response. If your application needs to accept JSON input, Rota ships with a JSON parser plugin, which will parse request bodies submitted in JSON format and treat them as submitted parameters. Rota uses a single route block by default. And since by default at all, you, really, you can't have a Ruby block that spans multiple files, that means that all routing must happen in a single Ruby file, which is only appropriate for fairly small web applications. Now, Rota has multiple ways of splitting the routing tree block into multiple Ruby blocks that are stored in separate files in order to support larger applications. The most common plugin for this is called hash branches which will use a separate block and file for each top-level branch in the routing tree. And for very large web applications, hash branches can be used in nested format to support arbitrarily complex routing trees. Rota ships with a content security policy plugin, so you can easily configure an appropriate security policy for your application, which can be customized on a per-routing branch basis. And one of the largest uh, security issues in Ruby web applications comes from incorrectly handling submitted parameters. And due to the fact that Ruby uses dynamic typing, it is easy for attackers to submit unexpected types in parameters. And Rota ships with a typecast params plugin that handles almost all parameter typecasting needs, allowing you to convert the submitted parameters to the expected types before the parameters are used. Rota ships with a route CSRF plugin that implements strong cross-site request forgery. So, uh, forgery protection. <laughs> so, so that all forms need to be submitted with a token valid for the current session, request method, and request path. So the CSRF checks can be performed at any point in the routing tree, making it easy to, to do CSRF checks for some requests, but not for others. 
The protection offered by the Route CSRF plugin is significantly stronger than the CSRF protection that Rails uses. Even if you choose to con configure Rails to support poor form CSRF tokens, since Rails will still accept generic CSRF tokens in that case. Finally, Rota includes a sessions plugin for encrypted cookie sessions. This checks for a valid HMAC before attempting to decrypt a session cookie, avoiding timing and other cryptographic attacks on sessions. So to sum up, Rota has a small core with almost all features implemented via plugins. So you only have to pay the cost for the plugins that you choose to use. And this is in contrast to Rails, which ships with all features enabled by default, where you have to choose the high-level features that you want to disable. It's also in contrast to Sinatra, which does not include support for many of the features that are shipped with Rota. Now, some Ruby programmers believe that if you use something that is not Rails, you have to rebuild most of what Rails gives you. And that may be true if you're using Sinatra, but it's definitely not true with Rota. In some cases, Rota ships with an equivalent for the features that Rails offers, and in other cases, there are superior third-party libraries that work with both Rails and Rota that you can use. So I'm going to briefly go over the different parts of Rails and what the equivalent could be for Rota. Action Pack is the heart of Rails, implementing the routing and the handling of requests. Core Rota and many of the routing plugins that ship with Rota are a direct replacement for Action Pack. Action View is what Rails uses for template rendering. Rota's render plugin offers equivalent functionality. Action Mailer is what Rails uses to send email. And Rota has a Mailer plugin for that. The Mailer plugin uses the routing tree to route requests to send email, allowing similar emails to share code. And this is the same benefits that the routing tree offers for web requests, resulting in simpler email generation code. Action Mailbox is what Rails uses to process received email. Rota has a Mailbox processor plugin for that. The Mailbox processor plugin uses a modified routing tree approach to share logic during the processing of received emails, which results in simpler email processing code. So those four parts of Rails have direct equivalence in Rota. So now let's look at some other parts of Rails that do not have direct equivalence in Rota, but can be handled by superior third-party libraries. So Rails uses Active Record for database access. With Rota, in my opinion, you would probably want to use the SQL database library as it's significantly faster and has more features than Active Record. SQL also uses a similar plugin system design where you only pay for what you use. Rails uses Active Model as an abstraction layer for model objects, handling things like validations and other things. SQL supports many of the same features as Active Model and can comply with Active Model's API, uh, at least the naming API, using the SQL Active Model plugin. Action Cable is what Rails uses to implement WebSockets support. In general, you can replace Action Cable with any cable, which offers much better performance. Rails uses Active Storage to handle and process uploaded files. Shrine is a superior third-party library that handling, handles uploaded files and it supports both Rails and Rota. Rails uses Active Job as an abstraction layer for various job libraries. Unless you really need such an abstraction layer, you can avoid the overhead and use the native API for the job library you are using, such as Sidekick. And Rails uses Action Text to handle rich text content editing, which uses the Trix JavaScript library to implement the editor. You can use uh, replace action text with CK editor on the JavaScript side or one, many, one of many other JavaScript editors and then store the data using SQL instead of active record. So the final piece of Rails is active support, which modifies many of Ruby's core classes. And from my very personal experience, often ends up breaking things in libraries that are not designed around usage with Rails. In general, you can replace active support with Ruby's core classes and standard library, in my opinion. One of the best parts about using any web framework other than Rails is that you are not forced into using active support. So if you're familiar with Rails, hopefully you now have a better idea about how you could handle all the same needs using Rota. If you want to get started using Rota, there is a free online book named Mastering Rota. This book was originally written by Federico Iacchetti, and I now keep it up to date with changes in Rota. And if you enjoyed this cop, it's this presentation and want to read more of my thoughts on Ruby programming, please consider picking up a copy of Polished Ruby Programming. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me talk about Rota.
And I think I'm out of time, so if I have any questions, please ask me during the next break. Thank you.